just a short review. <laughs> we laid out the line of the 144,000. We saw that we use Millerite history to understand it. So we connected some of those dates. Time of the end, time of the end. Increase of knowledge formalization test. Midnight. Beginning of a cry. Swelling of a cry, loud cry test. Both histories have a message associated with them. That's unlocked at Boston, but must swell to a cry. And then both way marks a shut door. When we bring that down to our reform line, we fill in all those details. We'd also connected this to the to the four histories of uh, agriculture. Remember five key way marks. Four dispensations. Repeating pattern. And for space, I've rubbed out the Levites, but you know it's inserted in here. We saw that this repeating pattern was for every dispensation. And in this way, a movement never stops moving. As, as soon as you cross one history, you enter into another and a new message. A new experience. We brought that down to the Nethanims and we saw that they must follow the same template. That every history must be a new lesson. But we recognized that that new lesson or new message is based on the old. We have to see the repeating pattern. Boston Concord Exeter. Boston Concord In each dispensation. We also see progression. You can see time, which is this history. Already from the time of the end. Two streams of information already from the time of the end. In this history, we're talking about a man, Donald Trump, 1989. In January, Time, Time magazine put out their, their magazine and the front cover was Donald Trump holding a Trump card. You can pin Donald Trump to January of 1989. In when we talk about progression, we can pin everything from the time of the end. There's a court case in 1989 where five innocent black men were charged with a crime they didn't commit. You can go back to that history and see Donald Trump 
And his response to that court case. If we talk about race and nationalism, you can see it from 1989. And we see this more and more. When we talk about progression, it begins here. And every opening message is built on the old. In this history of the Nethanims, we recognize there's two streams of information. We name them CNN and Fox. And that can confuse people. It's not confusing for an American. Because you can see these are opposite sides. But when we don't have such quick access to these two channels, it's more difficult to see. But these two channels, CNN and Fox, they're just titles, like a symbol of a source. When we talk about Fox, we're talking about right-wing news sources, of which Fox is leading the way in America. But you could list many other underneath them. Ones found in your country. And if not easily, go on to YouTube. Everyone has access to right-wing news. Which is why you can go to a country like Romania. They're thinking the same way as an American who listens to Fox. Because they go into YouTube. Find a right-wing news source. And they follow it. So Fox News is really just a symbol of a particular stream of information. CNN becomes another. Same way you talk about the Ula and the Hidakel. And under CNN, there are many other sources. Talk about the Washington Post. Yahoo News. Many others. And then we see these two news sources. And you can take all of these. New York Times. Many of these channels and you can pin them to what year? Nineteen ninety-six. Does anyone remember the Ula of Hidakel? Which one's good? Hidakel's bad? <coughs> Hidakel's bad. So Hidakel Fox. Ulai CNN. And the question can be asked, we think of the Nethanims, that they are being divided based on whether they align with CNN or Fox. But these two news sources, the formalization of those news sources is pinned to the formalization of the line of the priests. Not the line of the Nethanims. 
So the formalization of these new sources at the formalization of our message must be to teach us something. They're placed here for the benefit of the priests. 1996 is nothing to an ethonym. So it's these two streams of information. You could call it liberal and conservative. We think of liberal and conservative in the wrong way. What does it mean to be liberal? Liberal is liberality. Generous. Freedom. Conservative. We think it's good to be conservative. You go back into the time of Christ. And who are the conservatives? The Pharisees. Because to be conservative means you're trying to conserve. And to conserve is to be selfish. Because what are they trying to conserve? We're Jews. We're not like Romans or pagans, those Gentiles. We're not like Samaritans. We're special. We have a special culture. We're the glorious land. We're going to conserve that identity. Make sure no one else shares in it. We're going to take the writings of Moses. We don't know what they mean. But we're going to conserve them. Protect them. From this Jesus who keeps breaking them. To be conservative is to conserve. We're going to go into the history of the Civil War. The conservative South. They have their national identity. It's white. White. Bible based. They're going to conserve that at all costs. You see the same thing coming from these new sources today. If we forget about America, we go to Europe. Steve Bannon goes to Europe and he says Europe has this culture this beautiful culture it has a Christian base and all these immigrants and this China who's destroying us economically it's breaking down our culture you go to America they're the glorious land the city on a hill they're Christian they have an idea of what it means to be a member of the glorious land and behind Donald Trump are millions of conservatives afraid that they're losing their national identity. But you can find that in many other countries. In Britain, it was the European Union 
that they said was destroying their national identity. So the whole mindset behind Brexit is conservative. The European Union can't tell us to take immigrants. Can't steal our industry. Regulate our economy. So out of fear, their drive to conserve led them to, to Brexit. But you take these issues, you pin them on 1996. It's a priest that needs to understand the two sides correctly. Just as much as an ethnym. For an ethnym, this is what plows them. We tend to say that there's one message that divides two groups of people. But those that don't look like this side, they have another message. In fact, there's two messages that divide two groups of people. Those who don't like the message coming from Obama and Clinton have a message from Trump. It's most clearly seen here, but you can see it all through our reform. That they have two messages that divide them. If you don't like this movement, the prophetic message, you will find an alternative. And what is happening to the Nethanims in this history <laughs> sets them up <laughs> to either pass or fail <laughs> the Sunday law test. <laughs> if you're not benefited by the first, you cannot be benefited by the second. <laughs> and we understand that when we go to them, they're already a fully developed plant. Which means they've had all their latter rain, early rain. They were planted long before. Before that they were ploughed. So each dispensation has a particular truth. This dispensation, Daniel 11, line upon line, this dispensation is the 2520 in time setting. It's not understood at 9-11, but it's unsealed. There's an increase of knowledge. You can see 2005. I would argue you can see 2015 here. It's already increasing. But internally and externally, you can mark 2009. And presentations done in Arkansas called the 2520 Revealed that comprehensively cover this subject. But it isn't, all the information isn't there. 
2009. It has to develop further. It's all encapsulated in the 2520. Yes, and yeah, it is digital 2520. But we don't yet fully understand it. What has to come? It needs to go from just the 2520 to an understanding of the 126, the 151, and time setting. And that is 2012. So between 9-11 and 2014, the truth that is being opened up to God's people is based on the 2520. That's mostly revision we've just done. Remember progression, time of the end to second advent, not every element transferable, but within four histories a repeating pattern. And in every history, a message given. I want to just address one thought that seems to have troubled, troubled people the last few weeks. People see what is being presented today. And some of them are saying, this isn't right. Five years ago, or one year ago, or six months ago, I sat down with leaders and they told me the opposite thing of what you're saying now. So someone has failed us because this is not what we have been teaching for the last 30 years. And I don't understand that thinking. If we're going to accept in this history the time of the end magazine we have an increase of light on Daniel 11 if we have an increase of light on Daniel 11 what does that signify for our old light on Daniel 11 was not sufficient. In fact, some parts are wrong. We have a wrong understanding of certain elements of prophecy. So we come to this history where learning that there is no learning that does not require unlearning. You come to this history and it's time setting. If we're to accept time setting, what does that mean about our old understanding of time setting? We were wrong. We weren't understanding it dispensationally. Uh, so in 2009, you can hear presentations, don't know if they're done, I'm speaking hypothetically, I'm speaking as if they were, I don't know if they were. I would have no problem if there's presentations against time setting in 2009. But when the message comes, we learn and we unlearn. So when we have messages being shared now, 
It's not enough to learn. We must automatically unlearn. This is the problem with conservatives. They hold on to the old so tightly. They cannot move forward. If you can't move forward, you're not going to stay in a movement. So whatever is being shared here requires learning and unlearning. And we know that in this dispensation, this one, this one, and this one, we will learn and unlearn. And we need to be comfortable with that. Does not necessarily signify failure. Sometimes it does. We should have seen Clinton and Trump. But it's it's you can't avoid the need to unlearn. So I hope that fact stops troubling people. Because uh, many people are feeling challenged by that. So we've explained this dispensation as the 2520. It required us to unlearn. We've spoken about two streams of information. I want to just give a thought. There's a whole class in France that Elder Paminda did. I can't explain all the logic or the development of that study. But I want to share what I took from it. This is progression. Each dispensation is built on the old. And in each, more is required. So if in 1996, someone hands you a Time of the End magazine, I'll try and describe it this way. You're an athlete. You have to jump a three-foot hurdle. It's three feet high and you need to jump it. You pass or you fail. 2012, it's built on this. Now it's a six foot hurdle. You pass or you fail. You come to here. It's a nine foot hurdle. And you pass or you fail. Because it's built on what has come before. This is using line upon line. And the methodology from these histories. Where this is encouraging. Many of us are new. If you can jump a nine foot hurdle. Can you jump a six or a three? Yes. So you know that from the time of the end, no matter when you came in, everyone stands as equal. You get a tick here, a tick here if you get a tick here doesn't matter if you were here or not if you can jump that hurdle you've automatically passed all the previous history many of us found that encouraging there's one other element I want to bring into this line. 
If we just took one dispensation, 1989 to 9-11, we look at this history, increase of knowledge, formalization, test. But when are you really tested? If you're at church, I'll say if I'm at church, Sister Kutenda comes to me with the Time of the End magazine. Am I tested here or at 9-11? I'm tested here. I read that magazine and I can accept it or reject it. The same day I read it, you're tested at the formalization. I, I say it in the following way. You study for a test. You don't know the what's the you don't know exactly what's going to be on that test. But you study for it. And then at the formalization they put you into a room sit you down with a set of papers and they say this is your test and you're in that room from here to here the shut door they take your papers off you. You've put down your answers. You leave your room and they shut the door. Many people are waiting for November 9 to get some type of test. The test for this history was delivered with the Time of the End magazine. The message itself was the test. But there's a period of time for you to sit it. The shut door is the end of that period of time, not the beginning. At the shut door we hand over our papers and can't change our answers. Does that make sense? So we're in the test. In that sense, November 9 becomes an irrelevant external event. Irrelevant compared to what is happening now. The test was this history. This one. This one. This one. Even up here. It's the loud cry that's the test. Will decide whether or not people stand on what side of the door they stand at the close of probation. So we do not need to wait till November 9 to see our test. I want to just give one um, kind of parable. I think a different way to imagine our reform lines. I find that this has helped me try and remember. Just a suggestion. What is a reform line? If we turn to Ezekiel 20, 34. Chapter 20. Chapter 20, we'll start at 33. 20, 33 of Ezekiel.
as I live, saith the Lord God. Surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out so question, Mvunzo. it begins in 33, God says I will rule with a mighty hand, verse 34, you are scattered among many people, and I'm going to take you from a scattering into a gathering, how will he gather his people? How is he going to gather them? With a mighty hand. It's the hand of God. And if you draw a hand, and I can't draw, so Sister Kutenda. <laughs> Can you lend me your hand? <laughs> it needs to be bigger, but I'll have a template. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nope. <laughs> that one. <laughs> one more time. I need to get spaces. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> With a mighty hand, He's going to bring his people out from a scattering and into a gathering. And what are the characteristics of a hand? Five fingers, four spaces. You have five way marks. Four dispensations that takes people from a scattering time and gathers them. 1989, 9 11, 2014, close of probation, second advent. Five fingers, four dispensations, four histories. So if we have trouble conceptualizing our reform land, I'd like us to think about it as the hand of God. We won't go there for time, I'll just paraphrase it. Oh, it's in the same chapter. Ezekiel 20, it's 42. From verse 33 forward, those verses have a heading. That heading is the Lord will restore Israel. Israel. So this portion of the chapter is talking about the restoration of Israel. When it talks about the restoration, repeatedly talks about the symbology of a hand. God's hand. 
Ruoko Ramare. In verse 42. Move, verse 42. He says, You've been scattered. I'm going to gather you into, into your land of Israel. I'd done that before when I gave it to your fathers. I'd lifted up my hand once before and given that land to your fathers. So he'd lifted up his hand before and he says, I'm going to lift up my hand again and gather you. Just to make one point in, in case people trip over it. Psalm 89, 13. Psalm 89:13 says, you have a, a strong arm Sorry, mighty arm. Strong is thy hand. High is thy right hand. Do you know that's a repeat and enlarge? Strong is thy hand. High is your right hand. So when the Bible refers to God's hand, is it his right or his left? It's the right hand of God. That's the only reason we went to Psalm 89. It doesn't work so well on the left. But when God refers to his hand, it's referring to his right hand. First Peter five verse six. First Peter five six says to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. I would suggest that's the experience of a reform line. He will exalt us at the second advent. But before the exaltation must become the humbling. And the humbling experience is the process of a reform line. If we humble ourselves under a reform line now, we know that he will exalt us in due time. So this is our hand. It has five way marks. Nine. 1989, 9-11, 2014, 2019, Panium. Within this hand are the four dispensations, four spaces. You could say plowing, early rain, Ladder rain, harvest. And remember, with your hand, if it's to function, what finger do you not want to lose? Your thumb. It's the most important finger. The others do not work well without a thumb. It what makes our work possible. So I just want us to look at one characteristic. Uh, if we go to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 5. Daniel 5 is Belshazzar. Belshazzar's feast. Belshazzar the, the king made a great feast. It speaks how they desecrated the vessels of the temple. We all know this story. Daniel 5 verse 5. 
In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. First, the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand. Fingers. Plural. There's more than one finger. And what does, what does Belshazzar see? It says, he saw the part of the hand that wrote. Does he see the whole hand? No. He sees the part of the hand that wrote and fingers plural. If you're going to write with more than one finger, how many fingers do you write with? Two. Which two? You write with this one and this one. Do you write with this? If you're going to, not with a pen, that will, that's separate. <laughs> the context of this is you would dip your finger. You dip your finger in ink. And then you write on plaster. How many fingers are you writing with? Two. And which fingers? The second? And the third. So what does Belshazzar see? The portion or the part of the hand that writes. The second. The third. And there's a space in between. And what is written? Many, many tackle you fasten. What is written is the 2520 with the 126 and the 151. We take that to the hand of God to these two fingers and the space in between. That's the 2520. Takes these two fingers, the space in between, she's going to write the 2520 on the wall. I would suggest this is one, just one example that gives evidence that our reform line is the hand of God. And when we come into this dispensation, it's this part of the hand, it's this part of the hand that wrote the 151 and the 126, which we connect to this history. But this whole reform line is the hand of God. And it's talking about the restoration. It's going to restore the priests. Restore the Levites. And restore the Nethanims. So, for those of us who struggle to remember reform lines, try to connect it to your hand. If we connect it to our hand, you know the one finger you don't want to lose. You can see the 2520. There was one other principle. Oh, one other principle. Five fingers. What's the third? The third is midway. So if we were to do the 144,000, 1989, 9, 11, 
Chinona, nineteen eighty nine, two thousand and one. Sunday law. Chinona, Gurebe, Chinona, Sunday law. Close of probation, second advent. Sunday law. It's midnight or midway. Connect it, connect it back to your five way march. Whichever group is being restored, the midway point is Sunday law. It's midway and it's midnight. We're going to come back to that concept of midway uh, uh, um, when we get further in our studies. I don't want to move on to a new subject. Separate to reform lines. While it's on the board. So we'll just conduct some revision. And try and go over some of these things until our time is up. It's important that we remember this concept of midway. We're taking it literally from Millerite history. And bringing, bringing it into our own. So in Millerite history, the days between April 19 and October 22, if you split them exactly in the middle, brings you to July 21. So Millerite history is the literal and it's literally mid midway which they connect to midnight we take that as a symbol we go from literal to spiritual or symbolic when we've, when we've moved to the symbolic we no longer take it literally. So 2014 is not literally midway. Between 9-11 and 2019. Or April 19 and October 22. April, na 22 October. This is not literally the midway point between these two dates. But we still see it as midway because we've gone from a literal history and taken down a symbol. And it becomes important that we see 2014 as midway. Or midnight. So that when we go back into histories, and we deal with the literal, we're also going to go back to a, a, a midway point. To illustrate this, you have literal, and then you have spiritual, or symbolic. So you have the Millerite history. In Millerite history, July 21, Zuara, July 21 is literally midway. Take it to the symbolic. 2014 symbolically midway. No longer literal. But then we can go back to another history. We can go back to the Civil War. 
1863. And because we're bringing this history to our own, this history becomes literal. So 1863 must be literally midway. Again, we take it to our own. Spiritual. No longer literal. And we do this time and time again. 1794. Whenever we go back to a literal history, it's literally midway. That's the power of the symbol. It enables us to connect this whole history into a symbolic one of our own. But when we go to our own history, which is spiritual, 2014 is no longer midway. It still enables us to overlay the same histories. Civil War. French Revolution. Millerite. We're still able to overlay them. And we connect it to our hand. So we went from the line of the 144,000, connected that to the line of the Millerites, and we can see the repeating pattern. Some things are transferable because there is progression. Sorry, some things are not transferable. Because there is progression. Only one finger is the thumb, only one finger is the middle. But you can still identify repeating patterns. We took this as our template and drew three. And try to understand our experience through these repeating patterns. Those who successfully passed this test does not mean they successfully passed this test. And, and those who successfully pass both does not mean they successfully pass this one. The greatest danger in this movement is being conservative. Where we think that we don't have unlearning to do. And that we need to conserve our old beliefs. We don't know in the future what we're going to have to unlearn. So everything that has not been laid out prophetically is open to destruction. We don't know what God is go where these messages lead. People are asking today, how far is this all going to go? Like they're worried. If this is just the start, what's coming next? And the truth is, none of us know the answer to that. We can only know what's been prophetically laid out so far. 
But we do know that if we could handle it, God would tell us now. If we could handle time setting in 1996, He would give it to us. But He didn't because we couldn't handle it. What we're discussing in this history, we could not have handled in 2012. So remember, we're still in the early stages if we're 144,000. I don't know what truth is coming. But I know that if we could handle it now, we would have it. We could only stand firm on what is already prophetically laid out. And everything else is not worth conserving. We took this to the Nethanims. When Ellen White approaches her writings, when she talks about even difficult subjects, she always, I believe she always writes with their job function in mind. What impact is what she's writing going to have on their job function? When she's writing something, She's considering how this will impact their job function. And I think we do the same. If we can keep in our minds that all of this experience is preparation for a work. We have to be conscious, conscious of who we're going to be reaching, of who we will be reaching. If in this history we're calling God's people out of Babylon, be conscious of their experience. And we know now that the reason that we're not doing the ploughing early rain and latter rain is because we are not fit for that work. We know we're not fit because of 2016 particularly. We would have destroyed them before they were even planted. So we have a work of preparation. So that when we go to them, first the Levites, and then the world we have a pure message the message is pure but what we've done is mixed it with our tradition just like the disciples did it's unavoidable we don't know better because when we get the message of reform lines in Daniel 11 it's mixed in with our mind in our minds with all of these other beliefs no message based on time concepts we get from conservative Adventism about the role of women our traditions we're not fit for purpose until they're stripped away so I want us to, to think about the work we have to do. The experience the Nathanims are already going through. Look externally and see who stands on what side. 
Who's standing with Fox? What is their world view? Why do they think the way they do? Who stands with CNN? What are their characteristics? And remember that those two external streams are at our formalization. Because we need to understand the difference between the two sides just as much as any nethanim. It's dangerous when we disconnect the internal message from external events. Because they're all connected. And even when we're talking about 1989 or 9-11, we're talking about external events and using external sources to explain them. For the Nethanims, all they have is the external sources. And many people are struggling with our message now because they haven't seen the importance in these external events. They haven't seen the necessity of following them. And we're having to catch up in our understanding. So as, as we come to this end of our reform line, the end of the growth of the plant, we have another testing message that opened up in 2014. This is testing message is one message. It's testing three separate groups based on the stage of their development. For the Nethanims, what is their plowing? For a Levite, is their early rain? For a priest, is their latter rain? But it's the same core message. And we're sitting the same test. We're more developed. Therefore, more is required. But beneath that, it's the same test. And we do know that while it was accepted here, the test for this dispensation is not a test of time setting. That was light given for this dispensation. It's a different message that tests God's people here. So through our presentations, starting tomorrow, we're going to do some revision. We'll go back to Acts 27. Just briefly. Through Pyrus. Everything that we're studying will take back to the time of the end. But we're particularly wanting to understand what is happening in these five years. Whether you're a priest, Levite, or Nethanim, it doesn't matter. To the understanding of these five years that tests us. So before we close, just revision. We went to Ezekiel. 2033. It talks about the hand of God that's there to restore his people. That restoration is a process. And we map that process on our form line. Has five key way marks. 
Four dispensations. The midpoint of Sunday law. The first way mark is the most crucial. We went to Daniel 5. It gives us many, many tackle you fasten. The 2520, the 126, and the 151. So this portion of the hand. If we learn to map it on our hand, it becomes easier to remember the reform words. One of the main reasons I brought that up. But we could also conceptualize our reform line as progressive restoration. That process is not complete. It will extend to Panium for a priest. For 144,000. At Panium. We're still early in our journey. So we still have much to learn and much to unlearn. But we don't need to worry about the hurdles we have to jump in this history. Our focus should make sure, make, be making sure we can jump this one. And if we can jump this one, you get an A pass for every history previous. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for our blessings. Thank you for this camp meeting. Thank you that you are working to restore your people. I pray that none of us will resist that restoration. However painful it looks, Lord, however much we have to unlearn, I pray that we will be willing, that we might be fit for purpose, a people as you would have us to be, united, Lord, when we go forth to do the work. I pray that you'll be with our friends and family, those that will be Levites, those that will be Nethanims. Even now, may we set them a right example. I pray, Lord, that we will see the importance of this and bring our lives into order. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.